Welcome to CSI, Cooking Specialty Ingredients, The Entree. I'm Chef Daniel Gorman. This educational video for the Hospitality Education Foundation of Georgia has been made possible by the Georgia Department of Agriculture through the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service Specialty Crop Block Grant Program and funding from U.S. Foods and Dexter Russell. In CSI, The Entree, I'm going to demonstrate how crops can be used to create a seasonally inspired entree. Today I will be preparing fava bean puree, a lady pea cake, pan roasted chicken breast, corn O'Brien relish, and lemon sabayon. I'm going to focus primarily on vegetables today and not necessarily the proteins. I'll be using many different vegetables and herbs to create this competition style entree that you can use while competing or when creating your own menu at home. The terms, techniques, and tools I use today are some of that I use every day in my own kitchen. And you should do the same. So let's begin our mise en place. The first thing I'm gonna start with the corn O'Brien relish. There's several different types of corn that we use in the industry. My favorite being white silver queen, which is a sweeter corn. It is a lighter starch, so it's not so starchy on the palate. Um, it's very good corn. There are many different types of corn, but keep in mind, corn in the United States, mostly available in early summer. There are seven different colors of corn. Um, if you look into Indian corn or maize, there's purple, there's red, there's blue. It's an amazing product. So we just peel it, shucking it, and then cleaning off the silk. The silk is um, pretty much unedible. There are certain applications that you can actually use the silk for frying as a garnish. It has a nice popcorn flavor to it. It's pretty cool. This is the White Silver Queen, my personal favorite. Um, the cool thing about corn for me, especially sweet corn, is you can eat it raw. Um, it does like, have a lot of fiber, so don't eat too much of it, but it is a very good corn. Um, when I was growing up, I used to pick it right out of the garden and eat it fresh. All right, so we'll just clean our corn just like so, and I'm gonna slice it right off the cob. Do that all the way around the corn. After you do that, take your knife down the sides. What this is gonna do is get any of that residual corn that you cut off the cob. One very important part about corn is milking. You wanna take the back side of your knife, scraping down the cob. What this is gonna do, it's gonna remove any of the excess liquid sugars and starch from the corn cob with a lot of flavor right there, a lot of sweetness, really delicious stuff. I like to chew on them when I have <laughs> free time. <laughs> After we get done cutting the corn and milking it, do another quick one real fast so you can see what it looks like when it's blended together. As you can see, just from cutting the corn, you can see the contrast of color, that bright white corn against the yellow corn, it's gonna look very pretty on a plate. When you're done milking your cobs, usually what I like to do is make corn stock. It's really good for uh, cream corn or corn puree. Um, so you, know, you just break them in half and then set them aside for a corn stock for later on in the day. Corn stock, you usually just do some onions, a little bit of fennel, some corn and some celery. Works for really good corn stock, okay? Next thing I wanna talk about is scallions. We're gonna cut a few scallions for our preparation. Uh, scallions are a type of onion as well. Um, they have a nice green color and a more of an earthy tone. Bias cut, the greens are the tops of the scallions. For the whites, you can use these for stock, soups, or anything in between. The next key ingredient in our corn O'Brien relish is a little bit of acid. In this case, we're gonna use a lime. You can use lemon or you could even use a little orange if you wanna change the flavor profile. What we're gonna do for juicing, we're just gonna lightly roll it on our boards. What that's going to do is going to break down the membrane of the inside of the lime and help release some of those juices. Then we're just going to simply cut it in half and save it for later. Today we're going to be using bell peppers. There's a variety of peppers that you could use instead. Uh, jalapenos, habaneros, banana peppers. Their skin should be firm without any wrinkles and the stems should be green and fresh. Different peppers have different types of flavors and different types of heat. Next step we're gonna make in our corn and brown relish is roasting off some bell peppers. And with a pair of tongs, gently rotate the pepper over a flame. A lot of different ways to do it. There's fire roasting, you can roast them in the oven, on a grill, hand torch. What roasting pepper does is changes the flavor and the texture. You can get it very, very even. The very controlled heat where I can cook the pepper very minimally and have that nice fresh texture with a small smoky flavor and a very clean pepper at the end of the day. All right, so cleaning your pepper very gently. I'm gonna lay down a piece of plastic wrap 
Gently gonna wipe off the black or the burnt part where we've toasted off the skin. All that's coming off here is the skin. Cooks have a tendency to wanna wash a pepper. I don't believe in that. I feel like you're gonna wash away a lot of the flavor. Roasted peppers can be used in a variety of applications, but they can be used for coolies or other sauces. Soups, you can roast any different types of peppers. Roasting a pepper changes the flavor and texture of peppers. So you're just gonna gently wipe, wipe them off. A little bit of the toast or the skin left on it is fine. And that's gonna add a little flavor. You just don't want too much because if you add too much, you're gonna get a really strong carbon flavor in your food. After you remove most of the outside of the pepper, set it aside and finish cleaning up. Then I'm gonna show you how to cut the pepper. I'll take off the top and remove the bottom of the pepper. I'm gonna save that in a red pepper coolie. There's several ways to cut a pepper. The way I do it, I like to cut off the sides. That has a lot to do when you're picking your pepper as well. So when you're picking your pepper, you like to find nice flat sides if you're looking for a nice detailed cut. You can just discard the seeds of the pepper. There's no use for those. You always want to make sure that you remove the membrane of the pepper or the light white part on the inside of the pepper. Kind of looks like little fingers. There's a little bit of bitter flavor in there as well as that's where the capsaicin is stored. Capsaicin is what gives heat to the pepper. So when you're working with hot peppers, Removing the membrane is very important, especially when you're working with heat-sensitive clients or people that don't want spicy food. To cut the pepper, we're basically gonna do a nice small dice on it, maybe a little bit smaller, because we're gonna make a relish. You're trying to make everything look nice and uniform, so we're trying to mimic the size of the kernel of the corn. When working with peppers, green, red, or yellow, you can work with them exactly the same way. You're gonna cut them the same, you're gonna clean them the same, and then you're gonna prepare them the exact same way. The only thing you wanna be careful with peppers is the heat content. Some peppers have to be, some peppers are extremely hot, some peppers are very, very mild, such as bell peppers. Next thing we're gonna do is cut our red onion for our Corn O'Brien relish. Um, there's a lot of different types of onions. I'm a big fan of Idelia onions and red onions. Red onions have a mild flavor than your white onion. When you dice something like an onion and you're gonna do it for a fine preparation, always make sure to double check that you don't have any random or large pieces so you have a nice uniform product. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna assemble our corn relish and roast our corn. First we have a hot pan here. We're gonna have a little bit of olive oil in it so it doesn't stick. Also gonna add a little bit of flavor. It's be nice and hot. That's nice and hot. Oh, that nice sound. I love that sound. Add a little bit of salt to your corn. You wanna season as you go. Cooking's all about building flavors, just like puzzles, one piece at a time. We're gonna let that cook. We're gonna add the uh, roasted peppers, a little bit of our diced red onion, some scallions, a little bit of parsley. Parsley could be substituted with thyme or cilantro, some oregano. Go ahead and turn the heat off. We've got a little bit of color going on here. While this is nice and still hot, we're gonna add this to our bowl for our relish. We're gonna hit this with a little bit of lime juice. Acid's a key component in cooking. People like to tend to oversalt things, but acid is the thing that well rounds out the food. It brings out that extra pop that you always look for. We're gonna gently fold this together. Mmm, I can smell everything right now. It smells delicious. We're gonna let this marinate for about 30 minutes to an hour. You really want those flavors to meld together and make this a really nice, strong relish. Right before I put it away, I'm gonna hit it with a little more salt and a little more cracked pepper. Let's give it a taste. Make sure it's seasoned correctly. Mmm, that's good. We need to let marinate some more. Next thing I'm gonna start working on is our field pea cake. There's many types of field peas out there. The field peas are mostly available in early to late summer. Choose today lady pea or a pink eyed pea. There's many other types of peas such as butter beans, broad beans. You can always go to your local farmer's market and find a good variety of fresh peas. One good thing about these peas is they're nice and fresh and they have that nice crisp flavor like right out of the ground. We're gonna use these for our cake. So let's begin our mise en place. Now I'm gonna make a sachet. Sachets are just used to fortified soup stalks or even beans. In this sachet, I have peppercorns, thyme, and a small clove of garlic. So I'm gonna fold it up, and then I give it a light twist, and then I take a piece of butcher's twine, you can find this at your local grocery store, and then tie it off nicely. Very simple sachet. The parsley I use adds a little earthy tone to the recipe, as well as nice green color. Today we're using a curly parsley. Curly parsley has another cousin called Italian flat leaf parsley. Now that we've mise en place all of our vegetables and herbs, it's time to move on to cooking. The next thing I'm going to do is cook our fresh lady peas. First thing I'm going to do is render off a little bit of bacon. What that's going to do is add a smoky and salty flavor to the dish. As the bacon starts to cook, you'll notice it starts to sizzle. When this happens, I want to go ahead and add our onions to the dish. The red onions that we diced up. 
little salt and pepper. The next thing I'm going to add is a little bit of garlic clove. These are just whole garlic cloves that have lightly crushed. Wow, it's a great smell. I love the smell of bacon. You'll notice there's starting to get a little color on the bottom of the pan, and the onions are a little bit translucent. At this point, chili flake, though a little bit is all you need. You want to add these before you add your liquid because the oils come out and give you a nice bright flavor. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to add my chicken stock. I'm going to add a standard sachet of thyme and peppercorn. And then I'm also add one bay leaf. Then you can add your peas. You're going to let your peas cook for about 20 to 30 minutes until they're tender. You can go a little longer or a little less depending on the al dente or the tooth that you want in your peas. Now we've finished cooking our field peas. The liquid's reduced by about three quarters, and the peas are nice and tender. We're going to take the cooked peas, we're going to place these into a stainless steel bowl, liquid and all. The sachet that cook with them, make sure you give that a nice squeeze to get the excess flavor out of it, and then you can set this aside. You can add the rest of the stuff that goes in the pea cake. Sliced scallions, chopped parsley, Japanese breadcrumb called panko, fresh goat cheese or chevre, touch of apple cider vinegar for some acid. You can lightly mash everything together. The panko is going to absorb the excess liquid and cause everything to come together in a cake-like form. After your peas are completely mixed together, a little salt, a little fresh cracked pepper, make sure that's mixed in well. Okay, now this is a hot mixture, we need to cool it down. Onto a plastic lined quarter sheet pan, you're going to put your filling onto the pan to one side. Once you have it pretty much evenly distributed, take the plastic that's on the pan and fold it over lightly making everything nice and tight. Now that you have your cake formed, you can put it into a refrigerator to chill for one hour to be cut, shaped, and breaded. About an hour or so after we made our pea cakes, we're going to cut them for three plates or three portions. So we're going to cut straight through them. Now we're going to use a standard breading procedure to bread our pea cakes. Lightly coat the pea cake in cornstarch. Then give it a light tapping, remove any residual cornstarch. Go to your egg wash using your wet hand. Lightly coat the pea cake in egg wash. You want to let the residual egg wash remove from the pea cake and drip off. Place into your panko. Now using your dry hand, bread with the breadcrumbs. Make sure you have an even coating of breadcrumbs all around the pea cake. These breadcrumbs are seasoned with a little garlic powder, onion powder, and cayenne pepper and then a little touch of celery salt. Now you have a finished breaded pea cake. Repeat with the rest of the pea cakes and get ready to cook. In a medium to high saute pan, I'm going to add a little bit of olive oil. Make sure it's nice and hot. You'll see that the oil dances in the pan in little circles. After you notice the pan's hot, give a little test and make sure it's good. All right, I'm going to place your cake in the pan. It's going to start to sizzle. Go ahead and cook two of these. You're looking for a nice golden brown on both sides. Another way you can cook these cakes is in a deep fryer. But I'm a big fan of pan frying. I feel like I have a lot more control over my final product. After these are golden on both sides, I'm going to put them on a pan with a little paper towel to absorb excess oil. And then they're going to a low oven until they hit the maximum temperature, about 250 degrees. Leave them there for about five minutes, right before plating. The nice thing about these pea cakes is once they reheat, they're going to turn really moist again and kind of melt away. So when you cut into the pea cake, it's going to kind of ooze out. Check for color. All right, right onto the paper towel. Oh, it's a beautiful golden brown color. Oh, yeah. It'll be beautiful with the roasted chicken breast we're about to prepare. Nice and warm. Fala beans are similar to like any kind of bean or pea or pod. They're traditionally called a broad bean. These are one of the oldest used beans in the world. Traditionally used in Greece for uh, roasted candies and also used in Szechuan cuisine in China. We're using these for a fava bean puree. Start as this big pod and then hop them out of the shell. Pod's useless, you can discard it. Fava beans are one of the few beans that you'll need to clean twice. They have an outer pod and then they have an exterior shell as well. Most beans do, like peas, they all have this really small, thin membrane, but fava beans have a very thick membrane that you have to discard. Make sure you have fully boiling water and add lots of salt. It needs to be the taste of the ocean. Then we're going to add our beans in. 
The fava beans are going to cook pretty quickly. They're a bean. They're not as dense as some vegetables. They're going to cook in about three to four minutes to the tender. Then you're going to shock your fava beans, which is going to stop the cooking process. Just remove the fava beans from the water as soon as you shock them. You don't want to let your green vegetables become waterlogged. Now to clean your fava beans, you're going to cut right on the bottom side of the bean, very shallow cut, and then the rest of the bean will simply peel right off, just like so. The next thing we're going to start is our fava bean puree. First we're going to add a little bit of olive oil to a pan, flavor my oil, a piece of bacon. We'll let that bacon simmer for a second. The main reason for a puree on a plate is to add texture or a smoothness to the plate. This puree has a really earthy tone from the fava beans, a nice velvety mouthfeel. It'll help go really well with the chicken and the crispiness of the pea cake. So as that's running off some of the fat and giving flavor to the oil, I'm gonna go ahead and sweat off some white onion. Try not to brown your onions. You're going for nice, just building flavor here, not going for color. Go ahead and throw a garlic clove in here for a little extra flavor. After a minute or so, you want to remove the bacon from the pan. You're just looking for a little bit of flavor from the bacon. As you notice, in the pan, some of the onions are starting to turn lightly and translucent. Now it's time to add a little bit of our chicken stock. I want to add about a cup to a cup and a half. Then we're going to add our fava beans. These have been blanched before. So what we're doing here is we're basically just warming the fava bean back up. We don't want to overcook them or we're going to lose flavor and color. Now that the fava beans have simmered for a few minutes, it's time to strain off most of the liquid. Do not discard this liquid because we're going to add it back to the puree. Transfer fava beans into your high power blender. We're slowly going to add our liquid back to the fava beans to get the proper puree. And slowly turn the power until you get to full speed. Add just enough of the liquid to get back to the proper consistency. Now, you need to take your fava bean puree for seasoning. Spot on. Take a separate container and strain your fava bean puree, removing any of the extra granules that might have been left over. After you strain your fava bean puree, you want to make sure you hold it warm for service. If you do chill it down, chill it down quickly as possible to reserve the nice green color. When re-therming anything that's bright green, you need to do it gradually and add a little bit of liquid, such as stock, to help bring back to the proper consistency. So our fava bean puree finished. It's a nice smooth texture and a nice green color. The next thing we're gonna do for our dish is make a lemon sabayon. You always wanna pick a lemon that's not hard to touch, has a semi-firm texture on the outside. Now I'm simply gonna show you how to juice a lemon. Take your lemon and roll it gently beneath your palm. It's gonna break some of the cell membranes down inside the lemon, allowing for more juice to come out. I'm gonna cut the lemon in half. Then I'm gonna squeeze the lemon through a strainer gently. You can always use a reamer to do this or sometimes even a spoon but I prefer to just use my hand. From each lemon, you'll get approximately one ounce to three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. You would use the same process for limes, oranges, and grapefruits. When getting into larger citrus, you will always want to try to use a reamer or some kind of juicing mechanism. Basil, you always want to look for nice, shiny, bright green leaves, and it should be very aromatic. This is Genova basil or Italian basil sweet basil. Now we're going to pick our basil leaves off. Simply take the leaves off the plant, set them aside. You always want to make sure that you wash your herbs very thoroughly because they could always have small bugs or even sand on them. Over a double boiler or a pot in a stainless steel bowl, we're going to add lemon juice, white wine, and then we're going to whisk in sugar. Whisking the sugar until it's just dissolved. After that, we're going to add in our egg yolks, and you're going to increase your speed of your whisking. Sabayon is traditionally an Italian dessert. In this application, we're making a, a savory sabayon, where I've lowered the sugar, increased the acid, and add, added basil to make more of a savory flavor. While whisking over double boiler, what you're doing is you're cooking the egg yolks, slowly but surely. What that's gonna do is give you a light, airy foam. I'm gonna go ahead and add my basil since it's about halfway cooked. It's 
going to give a nice basil flavor. Remember to constantly whisk and stir your savion so it doesn't curdle. If you curdle, you'll have to start over or you won't have the right texture. As soon as the egg yolks start to get a little thick, go ahead and turn down your heat a little bit. For the Sauvignon we're preparing today, you could use uh, many different types of herbs, from tarragon to mint to even cilantro. All right, for my Sauvignon, I actually add a little bit more liquid. So it's not gonna be as stiff as a traditional Sauvignon because I'm using it more as a sauce in this preparation. So right here is about as foamy as I want it to get. I'm gonna turn off the heat. Remove the egg yolks from the heat, set to the side. We're gonna let these cool for about three to five minutes and then we're gonna fold in our cream. Now after about five minutes, our lemon Sauvignon is chilled down just enough to take the edge off. So now we're gonna lightly fold in some medium whipped cream. You always fold in cream when doing a mousse or a savillon in parts. First part's gonna really cream it out or make it easy to fold in the rest of the way. Then you wanna add another section. I usually do it in thirds. You'll notice I still have the basil leaves in here. You could remove the basil leaves if you wanted to. But in this instance, I want to leave them in so I can still build some of that flavor that's left in the leaves. I can scoop around them later on. A few lumps will be okay. I'm going to check it for seasoning. It's a good acidic flavor. Got a nice cream and airiness. It's going to go really well with the chicken and the cake. Finally, everything's done. It's time to start plating. Plating is an art in itself. It makes food taste better because it looks better. First key to plating, make sure you're always wearing gloves. Gloves always need to be in hand when plating. First, we're gonna start with our fava bean puree. Make sure it's nice and hot. Make sure your plates are nice and hot as well. We're gonna put a dollop of this on the plate, like so. Gonna do a nice pull throughout, just like a little paint stroke. Follow that by our field pea cake, a little off center. Give us some nice angles on the plate. Now we're gonna have a chicken breast, follow that to the back. Corn relish. It's kind of like your vegetable on the plate, so you're going to have a good amount of it. I'm going to go from the pea cake behind the chicken and down, spilling over, adding a little dramatic effect to the plating. Add a little on the other side of the plate for some balance, like so. And finally, lemon basil savillon. It's going to go right to the side of the chicken. You don't want to cover everything, just a light effect. Also a little drizzle around, some color. So our pan roasted chicken breast with fava bean puree, a fresh field pea cake, corn O'Brien relish, and a lemon basil savillon. Thank you for joining us on CSI. Cooking specialty ingredients. We'll see you next time.